Hey there, marketing researchers. In this video conversation, we're gonna talk about measurement and its application to marketing research. As we get started, let's introduce some basic terminology that we need to understand if we're going to be able to learn more about marketing measurement. Let's learn about this basic terminology by way of a running example. So let's imagine that we're marketers that uh, specialize in selling office chairs. Now, if we wanted to take some measurements about different office chairs, the object in question that we'll be studying is, in fact, the idea of a chair. And for now, we will ignore the ontological question of whether or not uh, a chair even exists or what a chair constitutes. Now, when we think about what distinguishes one chair from another, we recognize that the concept chair has a set of different properties that belong to it. In other words, a set of characteristics that vary between different chairs that distinguish them from one another. Some of the more obvious ones that may come to mind are the color or colors of a chair, the construction materials, the price of the chair, or the weight of the chair. Now, as marketers, we would probably want to think about the properties that go into a chair that we really think influence whether or not someone would make a purchase. So we have price there. That would definitely be one factor. Now, what other things do you think really influence whether or not an individual purchases a particular chair. Two of the likely candidates is the attractiveness of the chair and the comfort of the chair. And when we look closer, we realize that this attractiveness and comfort property are a bit different than the previous four. These first four properties are what we call objective properties. The color, construction materials, price, and weight of a particular chair stands independent of any one's individual assessment of the chair. But the attractiveness and the comfort of a chair, on the other hand, are examples of what we call subjective properties. Subjective properties are mental constructs. They're abstracted ideas that cannot be directly observed, yet we're still able to define them and ultimately measure them. Other examples of subjective properties common in marketing is satisfaction and brand loyalty. The reason that we define a particular property is because we ultimately are interested in measuring it as part of a research program. Let's focus in on the subjective property of comfort. How might we measure the comfort of an office chair? Turns out there's a variety of approaches we might consider using. We might simply ask people, Yes or no, do you think this chair is comfortable? Maybe we provide them some sort of rating scale so they can rate the level of comfort of a chair. Maybe we have people rank the level of comfort between different chairs, so they're actually making comparisons between chairs. Maybe we ask multiple different questions. Each one taps into a different aspect of the comfort associated with the chair. Or as a final example, maybe we actually observe people sitting in chairs and then document their physical reactions. Notice how on this last one, we're suggesting that we would actually take an objective measurement, their physical reactions, to infer the subjective state of the person's comfort. So whether they're cringing, they look relaxed, we would make the assumption that we can somehow relate their physical behavior to an underlying mental construct. This list here is not exhaustive, but it does illustrate something that emerges immediately when it comes to the idea of measuring subjective properties. There's usually a variety of approaches that we could consider, and they each have a different set of challenges associated with them. In marketing research, we often want to measure subjective properties, and these are some of the most, most challenging. To continue our introduction of the terminology, let's continue to imagine in this scenario that we settled on designing a survey. There's a variety of different questions in this survey. Some of them are not even about chairs at all, but we do have a series of questions uh, somewhere within the survey that are specific to office chairs. Now, this entire survey is what we call the instrument, or survey instrument. It's the complete set of questions or tasks that we use to take measures uh, for our project. The individual questions that we ask are called questionnaire items, and the particular way we collect the data or allow someone to respond is called the response format. And here we see a classic example of a Likert scale, a five-point agreement scale. Now in this particular example, our intention here is to actually utilize these two questions and merge them together in some way to come to a overall understanding of the comfort associated with a chair. In this example, because we're using two or more items, we call this a scale. There's a variety of different marketing scales that use multiple measures to capture underlying subjective properties. To add to a layer of confusion, later we'll learn there's these things called single item scales. Fortunately, the only thing that distinguishes a single item scale from a regular scale is that it only has a single questionnaire item. Now, if we decide that we are going to code strongly agree answers as a five, strongly disagree answers as a one, strongly disagree answers as a one, and two, three, and four in between, 
And then we're going to take those scores and average them between the two items to arrive at a single unified comfort score for each individual completing the survey. This process of identifying the numerical coding and the process of how we're going to merge those codes together is called coding or scoring or scaling. With this basic introduction of concepts related to marketing measurement in mind, let's proceed to further explore the way that we measure subjective properties in marketing. If we understand that subjective properties are not directly observable, one of the things that quickly emerges is that we're going to have to find some sort of indirect way to measure these concepts. Therefore, we must take these mental constructs and translate them to some form of intensity continuum. There's an important requirement here. Whenever we have a construct, it must be clearly defined. For example, we've just been using the word satisfaction right now as though we have a clear understanding of what satisfaction means. If we're going to make a measurement system to measure satisfaction, we must be, we must be much clearer what we mean satisfaction is. Once we've clearly defined this construct, then we can develop some sort of concrete tool to measure the construct. This process of translating a clearly defined construct into a concrete measurement tool is called operationalization. That's a big word you can use to impress people at the next dinner party. We know that we can't drill a hole directly into this person's head and extract out their level of satisfaction with the Sholos. So how can we get at estimating what their level of satisfaction might really be? Well, first, following the steps above, we have to define it. Satisfaction with the Sholos is defined as the extent to which a consumer's expectations about the Sholos on-field and off-field experience has been met. This is the definition that we will work from to then develop our measurement system. Now we can operationalize it. And in this particular example, we've operationalized it with using using two questionnaire items. On a five-point satisfaction scale, how satisfied are you with the on-field performance of Club TJ? On a five-point expectations met response scale, overall, how well have the Sholos met your expectations for the home game experience? Then our scoring procedure says take the average score from the two questions. Now, we did in fact operationalize this construct into something that's concretely measurable. That doesn't necessarily mean that we've done it correctly. That's not what this slide is about. For example, look at our definition of what satisfaction means. If we haven't defined satisfaction correctly, and maybe this definition is inappropriate, then that means anything that we do subsequently is going to be incorrect. Secondly, look at these two survey questions that we've generated. One of them deals with a direct measure of satisfaction of on-field performance, and one deals with expectations being met for the home game experience. There might be other things that feed into people's satisfaction with Club TJ that's not about the home game experience nor about on-field performance, such as television, radio, uh, merchandise, the behavior of the team off the field, and so on. We're ignoring those entirely with our operationalized measures. In addition, look at our scoring procedure. It says take the average score from the two questions. Taking the average score from the two questions it makes life easy, but it does also create another assumption. We're assuming that satisfaction with the Sholos is equally driven by on-field performance and meeting expectations at the home game. Perhaps this isn't true. Perhaps on-field performance is the key driver and it deserves additional weight. Even in this brief example here, it becomes immediately apparent this idea of measuring subjective properties can be rather tricky. Oftentimes when we measure subjective properties, we use multi-item scales. Let's, I would like to provide you a couple examples of multi-item scales that are used in marketing research. In particular, we're going to look at compulsive buying. There's a paper from 1992 by Faber and O'Quinn where they define compulsive buying as chronic, repetitive purchasing that becomes a primary response to negative events or feelings. So negative stressful events trigger some sort of uncontrollable purchasing, and this is what they define as compulsive buying. This is the scale that they've developed. Let's look at some of these. Let's take a look at some of the early terminology we had and how it applies to this scale that's in front of us. First, when they conducted this study, there were other questionnaire items about gender, income, self-esteem, and other and others. Therefore, the entirety of this thing, including the scale you see before you, is called the instrument. The compulsive buying scale itself is a multi-item scale. I see seven different items here: one at the top and six below. Each of these individual seven questions represent the questionnaire items. There's two different types of response scales that are used in this particular scale. We have an agreement scale above. There's just one question that corresponds with that response scale. Whereas a subjective frequency scale is used for the remaining six items below. The scaling system was rather straightforward for this particular scale. In all cases, a one to five scoring methodology was used. Then 
Faber and Gwynn provides us the way to properly calculate someone's individual compulsive buying score. If you look below, the very bottom there, you'll see that compulsive buying is equal to, and then there's a math equation. If you see those bold terms, Q1A, Q2A, Q2B, and so on, the idea is that we would take those numerical values that are in the green section above, and we would plug those corresponding values down into that math equation, and then we simply just solve. And then according to the paper by Faber and O'Gwin, if somebody scores lower than negative 1.34 after we complete that math equation, that person's labeled as a compulsive buyer. Let's take a look at another alternative compulsive buying scale. This idea of competing scales is pretty common in marketing research. Subjective properties are tricky to measure. Therefore, there's lots of different people who've tried to tackle measuring important subjective properties. First, look at Ridgway's definition of compulsive buying. It's a little different than the one that, was that we saw earlier. Compulsive buying is defined as a consumer's tendency to be preoccupied with buying that is revealed through repetitive buying and a lack of impulse control over buying. Notice that there's nothing about stressful events triggering compulsive buying in this particular definition. Look at some of these questions, uh, these questions that were asked of the survey respondents below and notice how these questions correspond more closely to Ridgway's definition here rather than Faber and O'Gwin's definition of compulsive buying earlier. This should underscore just how important it is to properly define the way that you're characterizing your subjective property. Here we see the response scales that are associated with Ridgway's new measures in this six item multi-item scale. First there are four seven point agreement scales and below there are two seven point subjective frequency scales, with only the edge anchors of always and never being actually labeled. Ridgway scaling was similar to the approach used by Faber and O'Gwin, except of course since they have seven different points, they have a seven point scoring system. This time though, higher scores tend to correspond with more compulsive buying indication. So for example, look at that first question, my closet has unopened shopping bags in it. If you're someone who has that, maybe you're more likely to be a compulsive buyer and you just say that you strongly agree with a score of seven. Ridgway's scoring process was much easier than the one Faber and O'Gwin proposed. Ridgway says simply to sum up the scores that a person had to all six questions. In other words, all six questions were treated equally important. So if someone disagreed, strongly disagreed to all six questions, they would score a six, meaning the lowest possible score in the compulsive buying scale, where if we summed up uh, someone who agreed strongly to all these questions, they get a max score of 42, which is the highest compulsive buying score they could have. A fair question to ask is why we use multiple items to measure a subjective property. The answer is that it's often unlikely that a single question is capable of perfect, perfectly capturing the concept we're interested in, interested in measuring. For example, let's consider again the concept of compulsive buying. And now let's consider one of those measurement items. This is one of the ones that's used by Ridgway. Much of my life centers around buying things. This single item clearly, clearly has some overlap with the idea of compulsive buying, but it also misses the mark. As just a few examples, perhaps somebody who has a job as a buyer for an industrial firm says that much of their life centers around buying things. It has nothing to do with them being a compulsive buyer, merely that their career actually is, does in fact center around buying things. Or maybe someone's a passionate collector of Star Wars memorabilia. This is a hobby that they're very interested in. And therefore, their life centers around buying things. This is something that they score high on, but they're not actually compulsively doing it. It's a, natu it's a healthy hobby. Or perhaps a stay-at-home parent who's annoyed with all the required shopping that they have to do. Perhaps that they say that much of their life centers around buying things, but this is more a, a articulation of their frustration rather than an indication of their actual compulsive buying behavior. This simple illustration shows why we often use multiple items. In most cases, we know that any given questionnaire item is not going to completely cover the concept and it'll miss the mark in other ways. The idea is if we use multiple items, we will be able to capture all the different subtle domains of that concept in an aggregate, when we average those things together or weigh those things together in some other way, we will better capture the underlying subjective property. Multi-item multi measures seem to be in less frequent use in contemporary marketing research. Recent trends in marketing research have tended to favor single item scales or very short multi-item scales, four items or less. Why is this? Well, we are aware that survey respondents are becoming increasingly intolerant of lengthy surveys. We simply cannot ask people to spend as much time on a marketing survey as we used to be able to. Therefore, we have to shorten the number of items or we won't have valid responses. In addition, we've also learned that survey respondents become frustrated or annoyed when they believe that they are answering identical questions. Oftentimes, when we have people fill out many different questionnaire items, all tapping into the same subjective property, those questions may seem somewhat similar to the person taking the survey. This tends to frustrate them, and a frustrated respondent does not give thoughtful answers. 
If a survey respondent sees multiple items that all look similar to one another, they may begin to start generating their own hypotheses about what the purpose of the study is. This is not healthy for your research. You don't want your respondents trying to guess what the actual study is about, and it, because if they do, they may alter their responses to fit those expectations. So this current trend of reducing the number of multi-item measures in marketing research could be summarized as, it's better to have a survey respondent thoughtfully and honestly answer a single best-in-class question rather than be poorly engaged with answering multiple questions. Let's take a look at a popular single item scale. The Net Promoter Score scale is one of the most common scales that marketers use in the world today. You've probably seen this scale as well and responded to this scale in a recent survey. The NPS scale question always comes in this format. How likely is it that you would recommend this company to a friend or colleague? Sometimes where it says company, it could actually be the name of the company, a brand, a product, a service, or an experience. A traditional net promoter score scale question should have 11 points, 0 to 10, with the anchors being not at all likely to extremely likely. After respondents complete the net promoter score scale question, those codes are then recoded for the actual scoring purposes of the marketing researcher. If a respondent scores from 0 to 6 on this scale, they're recoded as a detractor. You can imagine this as a negative 1. If they respond with a 7 or 8, they're coded as a neutral, that's a score of 0. And if they're scored a 9 or 10, they're called a promoter, they score a positive 1. Then it comes time to score a company's net promoter score. So it's a rather easy computation. You take all the survey responses, and a company's net promoter score is simply the percentage of promoters, so those people who answered 9 or 10, minus the percentage of detractors, those who scored 0 to 6. That means the potential minimum would be negative 100, every single person was a detractor, or a potential maximum of 100 where every single person was a promoter. Let's illustrate one use of the Net Promoter Score in action. Retently is an online software company that helps subscription-based businesses track and manage, you guessed it, customer retention. What we see here is the Net Promoter Score benchmark amongst Retently's customers. So when you look at these industries here on the left, keep in mind these are strictly companies within those industries that have services through Retently, meaning they're also only subscription-based companies. And we see the average net promoter score level amongst these customers, amongst these industries. Notice how amongst insurance and digital marketing agencies, the average net promoter score is quite high. That would imply companies in this industry selling subscription-based services to manage similar benchmarks would have to have particularly high net promoter scores. On the other hand, financial services and healthcare subscription-based companies have relatively a lower average benchmarked NPS score, implying that you don't have to have quite as high of a net promoter score to maintain a high relative advantage in the marketplace. There's a variety of uses for net promoter score, but this simple illustration gives you one idea of how they're used.